work? Will this work? Do I most admire? Well, you know what? You can't get better than uh, Saving Private Ryan <laughs> right now. Whoever did that. I don't know who did that, even. Uh, but Rick Baker, anything Rick Baker does. Uh, Rob Bottin, of course, is a genius. Uh, the greatest makeup artist to me, though, is Dick Smith. It'll always be Dick Smith. Uh, everything we do, everything any makeup artist does today was invented by Dick Smith. We just kind of make it better, you know, or enhance it somewhat. Uh, but uh, Dick Smith is the god, you know. Um, and if you're interested in learning special makeup effects, uh, there's flyers on my table from my school. But if you go to my website, sabini.com, I have all this, I have three schools listed there, Dick Smith's, my own, and Joe Bosco's. Even, even my school will, will, will feature Joe Bosco makeups. But uh, 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 Dick Smith has a correspondence course. It's 20 volumes, videotape slides, and it's, uh, it's the least expensive way to learn it. Uh, but he sent it to you. You have to teach yourself at home. You learn at home. And the money that you save on his course, you buy your own materials and teach yourself. If you need over-the-shoulder training, that's where my school comes in, or Joe Blasco's, or uh, uh, there's quite a few. It depends on where you live. If you don't want to move, you don't want to travel, then get Dick Smith's course and learn it enough. If you go to Pittsburgh, go to mine, you go to Florida, go to Joe Blasco's. But anyway, so I, I said that because almost everybody asked that question. I answered it ahead of time. I see a hand over here? No. Yeah, right there. Uh, do you have anything new coming up? Anything new? Um, I'm going to be a villain, a recurring villain in a new TV series of Sheena, Sheena of the Jungle. Uh, we're shooting at Disney MGM Studios. We started in July. And they also wanted me to do the makeup effects because Sheena turns into an animal. But I formed that out to uh, K&B, Greg Nicotero, and not my pals, my, my ex-assistant, because they're a factory. They can do that stuff a lot cheaper than I can do it. Uh, you know, for me to gear up a crew and stuff. So I'm going to just play this villain and K&B will do the effects. And I'll be a, a special effects consultant on the show. I'm doing a movie called Hell Quest in Denver. I play uh, some escapee from some asylum and I just kill people. Um, I'm also playing, I'm playing a martial artist villain in uh, this movie called Shattered that we're shooting in Florida uh, next month, actually. And there's a bunch of small things, you know, you've you got to treat everything like it's really going to happen. So there's a lot of promises out there about contracts behind them. And if you're wondering about Vampirates, Vampirates is in limbo right now. The producers are saying things like, hey, how about if we get rid of the pirates? <laughs> so you know what those conversations are, you know. So I don't, I don't have much faith in vampires uh, happening uh, anytime soon. But I wrote a thing called Most Dangerous Game. It's in the hands of Quentin Tarantino. I sent it to George Clooney. I sent it to Miramax. I sent it to Artisan. The only person to call me back was George Clooney. He liked it, but he's looking to do uh, quirky comedies lately. And the thing I wrote is a big action player. Oh. I thought he'd be good for it. What? Oh, I thought that's why you answered me back. Am I missing anybody back there? I don't want to miss anybody. Yeah, right there. Um, whenever you're acting or directing something, do you ever, uh, are you ever tempted to set the like, special effects guy to do it this way? Well, you have our, okay, when I'm acting on something, do uh, am I tempted to step in with the effects guys? Well, on Dust Till Dawn, you know, Nick Otero sat with me and did that beer bottle scene, you know? So I said, you know, Greg, you're sitting here acting. I've got to do some special effects. You're going to need to splash some, splash some blood on somebody, you know? And I did splash blood. On somebody in Dust Till Dawn, but I really don't remember what who went. Um, Dust Till Dawn took 10 weeks. I was there for eight. I left to do the demolitionist, and I went to visit the set. And George Clooney was on the ground fighting me, the big rat, you know. Hey, Savini, I'm fighting you over here, you know? Cool, you know, so. <laughs> uh, But yeah, of course. I mean, but uh, in the case of Nicotero, I purposely, I purposely didn't want to say anything about the effects on uh, Dust Till Dawn, because that was Greg. Greg was my assistant, and it's his job. I did suggest that they put blood on the uh, on the chair, on the table legs when, they, when Fred Williamson threw the vampires on them, you know? I thought there should have been blood uh, on the legs. But he told me to uh, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and because, you know, okay, Greg, okay, uh, so many things happened. Like when Greg was on my crew, they would complain like, hey, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any uh, fixative spray. We don't have this or we don't have that. I would say, well, what if you were in the middle of a desert and didn't have that? What would you do to make them think? You know, limitations make you more creative. What would you do if you didn't have the right stuff? So uh, I also would mock fire him. I would just say, oh, get the fuck out of here, you're fired. You know, and he'd leave for a couple of minutes and come back, you know, an hour back. Just as a mock fire. So I went down to visit him on the set of Spy Kids, Robert Rodriguez's new movie uh, in Texas. Um, Antonio Banderas, Terry Hatcher, um, 
Danny Trio, Robert Patrick. And it was Greg's job, Greg was doing the job. But he actually, when I went to visit him, put me on the payroll, on the effects payroll. He said, I've always wanted to put you on my payroll, have you work for me. And he fired me that day. <laughs> he mock fired me. So he told me, I asked him for something. He said, what if you're in the desert? Didn't have that. You know? <laughs> so it took like 15 years for him to get back at me, you know, with, uh, with that. But uh, also, I wanted to meet, uh, I wanted to meet Antonio Banderas. I wanted to get a picture of me taken with uh, Antonio. And I didn't quite know how I was going to do that, because, you know, he's a busy guy, star, trader, you know, untouchable. But there was a knock on the trailer door. Robert Rodriguez came in, grabbed me, took me to Antonio Banderas. He said, this is Tom Savini. He was the, he spoke Spanish to him. I guess he was talking about the Dust Bowl Dawn because he kept doing this. <laughs> and Antonio went, oh, yeah, here we go. You know, we talked about Zorro. I told him he was the best Zorro. We talked for a long time. And then we did a scene together. Rodriguez put us in the scene together in this movie called uh, Spy Kids, which is unbelievable. It's like a cross between Wizard of Oz and Willy Wonka and Scissor Hands. It's just this weird kids movie, uh, Tony Shalhoub is in it, um, and uh, I'm not supposed to talk too much about that one, but uh, it's called Spot Kids, and I'm going off on a tangent, what did you ask me? <laughs> oh, about doing the facts, yeah, if I see stuff, well, uh, well there you have it, <laughs> yeah, right here. When I was 12 years old, how did I get into it? Yeah, I, well, I saw A Man of a Thousand Faces, the story of Lon Chaney. You know, my son's name is Lon. I named him after Lon Chaney. And I wanted to be Lon Chaney when I grew up. You know, he was a makeup artist, a stuntman, an actor. So far, I've done all those things. Um, but uh, uh, that was it, when I, I just flipped out. Because it was the first movie that showed me how, no, it's the first movie that showed me that somebody creates these monsters. Because before that, I believed they were real. I believed Frankenstein was real, mommy, all that stuff, and it scared the hell out of me. I wish today I could see a movie again through the eyes of an eight-year-old child, because that's where the magic was that made me want to get into movies. And if you feel the same way, you've got to know one thing, that if you want to get into movies because of the magic, be prepared to have that magic completely destroyed forever and for the rest of your life. You will never see a movie again the way perhaps you see it now with, uh, and, be and believing everything. I mean, i got to see a movie eight times or, or be stoned before I see it, you know, <laughs> see the story come at me, you know, because I mean, I'm watching for performances and you know makeup and camera angles, and that's bullshit. I wish I wish I could erase that from my head. But to some, you know, to get what you want, half of getting what you want is knowing what you have to give up to get it, and you give up the magic when you uh, are involved in movies. Right there, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, a couple questions about the Man of the Dead. Was this uh, uh, Malcolm Golan's idea or George Romero's, or did somehow? Uh, I don't know how, I, how Night of the Living Dead got financed. I think at that time, George could only get financing for Night of the Living Dead. He must have gone to Canon Films and got them interested in it. You know, at festivals, at Cannes, who knows where these guys meet. Uh, they probably had a meeting, and, uh, and, and George suggested that, and they went for it. But Columbia bought the film two weeks into shooting it from Menachem Golem, and that's what caused so many problems, because uh, instead of having 10 weeks to edit it, I had three. Um, and even beforehand, they were—they all got scared. They all got very scared. Um, it's only 40% of what I intended to do, uh, this movie. Uh, um, Tom catching on fire was one thing I didn't get to do. But there were so many other things, like um, at the end when the zombies come in and they attack Ben, uh, I wanted, uh, Patty was in, like trying to get out the kitchen door and zombies were like attacking her. Ben's trying to save her. He can only get like one bullet in the gun. And the zombie attacks him, and the, the chamber spins, and, the, and there's no bullet in front of the hammer. So he's like, and the zombie attacks Ben. And he sticks the gun in the zombie's mouth. And it was the, I want to do a close-up of the bullet clicking, getting closer to the hammer, while Patty's being attacked. You know, it creates some suspense and tension there. And, uh, and then when you see the bullet finally get in front of the hammer, I had the effects guys build this frame, this big frame with flesh, big fleshy substance, and a hole in the middle. And they built like two or three of those, small hole, a big hole, smaller hole, smaller hole. Like it's a bunch of frames, and they were on stands. And what I want to do is when the gun, when the bullet goes in front of the hammer and he finally fires, you would expect to see the zombie's head blow apart. But I was going to throw in a, like a white gym camera and white frame, and then just zoom through the flesh to barber the door and splash blood on there. So he'd, he'd be the, 
you'd be the bullet traveling through the zombie's head and splashing on Barbara. So I said that, and they said, no, you don't have time to do that. And that was that. They kept saying no, no, no to all these uh, great ideas that we had in storyboards that they okayed in the first place. And when it came time, they just kept giving me no. In fact, at the end, Barbara was supposed to go up, Barbara was supposed to go up to the attic when she goes into the house. And uh, this thing is a pain in the ass. Uh, hello? Yeah, this might be better. Uh, hey, the list was gone. I had a list on that one. I want my list, no. Um, anyway, so Barbara goes up in the attic, and she's looking around, and uh, because as she approaches the house, she sees some movement up in the attic, and she thinks it's Ben. So she goes right up to the attic, and uh, she doesn't see anything. There's like a full-length mirror sitting there, and Harry's hiding behind the mirror, but you only see his finger sticking out in front of the mirror. So then he peeks out, and, and that's where he says, you came back, you came back. And then she raises the gun, and he hides behind the mirror, and Barbara sees her own reflection in the mirror and shoots that. And of course, we see Harry's point of view of dying, and he falls. The last thing he sees is Barbara's a reflection in the mirror, and it's all fucked up because you know, she shot it, so she looks weird, which is a metaphor, kind of a symbolic uh, reference that she's changed. She's become like the, like the hunters, okay? And uh, she sees it herself and realizes that. So that would have been like a really cool, I thought, uh, Lolita kind of an ending for, the, for Harry's death. But there was no time. We were running out of time, so we had to go for that quick Harry poem. And it works. I mean, you obviously cheered when Harry died. I noticed also that when Jack Russo and Russ Dreiner's name came on, you guys booed. Thank you very much. Because uh, <laughs> those are the two producers that gave me, uh, and they weren't even supposed to be on the set. You know, and, uh, and I kept saying to George, George, listen. Well, you, know, you don't want me to listen to these guys, do you? I mean, you want this movie to be on the level of them? He said, they know what they're doing, they've been in the business 25 years, and I've never said this before. So, uh, and I couldn't bring the film down to their level. And only recently was I, I felt so good, George and I did the commentary, the DVD commentary for uh, Knight Riders and Martin recently. <laughs> uh, but while we're doing that, I mean, I, I was dying to talk to him about this night of a living day.